So good morning. Thank you for that introduction. I uh, uh, want to talk about our experience of opening a, uh, a clinic uh, in an outpatient setting, um, not in a non-academic center, uh, where we implemented different technology and how we use VisionRT basically for every patient uh, full body applications. So I'm very excited to share our experience and looking forward to learning more and taking it back to our group uh, to implement more in our clinic. So there have been significant advances in radiation oncology over the past few decades, you know, from having the intent of this, uh, of this hiker as the target for our radiation. And over the last few decades, we've gone from treating four field boxes to smaller and smaller fields going to conformal treatment planning with CT-based planning, going to IMRT, smaller and smaller fields uh, with image guidance. And this has really allowed us to really escalate dose for a variety of tumors, allowing us to have better outcomes as well as minimizing toxicity. Also advances in our linear accelerators from our vendors have allowed us to have faster delivery of dose, uh, flattening filter free beams that allow high dose of radiation all the way up to 2400 MU. Um, so this is uh, exciting for us, however, as we as we go to image-guided radiation, we're making smaller and smaller margins for our patients. And so the question is, when we set up a patient in the room, we walk out, we image them with a cone beam CT, do our match, and the delivery is very rapid, you know, two or three minutes of delivery time, is the patient moving during that time? Of course, we have internal motion that we can't really control, respiratory breathing, any kind of bowel or bladder function that we're compensating with our PTVs. But what if the patient moves or, you know, gets more comfortable or relaxes once the therapist out of the room? We're not, a, we're not really accounting for that. So I think the, the latest advance, which I think in our clinic, uh, which we've seen very beneficial, is using surface-guided radiation therapy. Not just making sure the patient's positioned before the treatment, but during the entirety of the treatment. And if they do move, the beam automatically turns off because we do have that MMI interface. So really faster than a therapist can really see the patient move and beam off, the beam is actually gated and turning off. So I think that's very valuable as we treat smaller and smaller fields to have good outcomes in minimizing toxicity. So Kelsey Siebold uh, Clinic is a multi-specialty group, has about 27 locations around the Houston area. Uh, is mainly a primary care-based uh, clinic uh, that feeds the cancer center. And we have two locations, uh, one in the north side of town and one in the medical center uh, in Houston. And this was actually the first accountable care organization in the United States. Uh, the Cancer Center is accredited by the American College of Surgeons and most recently ASCO's QLPI. So prior to 2015, uh, we've, we've had oncology services really doing chemotherapy, but most of the radiation patients were, were farmed out to other centers in town. So we really didn't have that coordinated care uh, that, that we really wanted to have under one roof. So uh, the goal was to open a clinic um, in the medical center, having everything under one roof, having chemotherapy and radiation, really focused on patient care, making sure the patient has a good experience because there's a lot of choices in Houston uh, for radiation therapy, and really making sure that we have the right technology for the right patient. Uh, so that, those are some of the goals when we open the clinic. So in, so in uh, 2012, uh, Kelsey had hired a consulting group, a physics group, to do the vault construction and planning. And actually, the, the equipment was already selected prior to the physician staffing uh, model. So they had selected a true beam, uh, pretty much fully loaded, and also had Vision RT. And so in 2014, they uh, selected our group to cover the center and uh, run the center. And we started hiring staff. You know chief therapist, therapist, um, dosimetrist, and first thing was, well, we're going to open in 2015, let's send everyone to true beam training, make sure everyone knows how to run the machines, coming from maybe a non-true beam experience. Uh, really had really great seasoned therapists, and um, the other training we went to was Vision RT, and so with our package, it really came with two, two uh, credits. So the chief therapist and phys physicist went to that training, and I, and I, I was kind of curious because I said, well, I'm, I'm staffing this clinic. I've kind of had minimal experience covering another clinic with it, and I really wasn't too excited about it with my first impression. So I wanted to go to that training as well. So we bought some extra credits to go to that training. And I think it's very important 
as a clinician to see what the actual benefit or use uh, for this technology is for our patients because, you know, you're, we're the ones actually prescribing that treatment or when to use it with the, with the help of our physicists and the therapy team. So I think I found that it was very valuable. So during this training, you know, we really found out about the fundamentals of the system, understanding workflow, how we can utilize it for these patients. You know, what are these regions of interest? Should we just draw, you know, across the, across the chest for breast patients or should we really focus in on certain areas? And I think when we, when we left that training from Baltimore, we all thought, you know what, breast setups is, is where we need to use it. The IBH, maybe down the road as we implement this technology, it was probably the, the main uh, disease site that we could really use this technology in. So when we opened in 2015, talked about the Vision RT uh, on the TrueBeam, and, and we didn't know what the real volume was because all these patients were sent out. We didn't really have uh, a count of how many patients were being sent out. So you know, the goal, clinic's goal was to treat about 15 patients a year the first year. Um, so we thought, well, with that volume, we could probably share a resource rather than putting a dedicated CT simulator in. So we shared the PET CT. However, it did have challenges, you know, smaller bore size, a lot of the immobilization equipment that we'd use for a breast patient with, you know, the, the arm cups doesn't fit through the, through the bore. So those were some challenges that we did face. Some of the good problems, two months into it, we're treating 40, 45 patients. So who was happy? Administrators were very happy. Patients were very happy, you know, that everything is done in one place. However, two months into it, we're still kind of getting our feet wet, getting comfortable with the technology, getting comfortable with patients. Most of the patients were breast and prostate patients. So a lot of the patients weren't prepped properly, not, you know, having an empty rectum, not having full bladder. So those were challenges in rescheduling patients. So we had long days, and, and I can't thank the therapy team and uh, our group for being there to make sure that we were successful. Um, and so it's difficult to implement any technology in a bu busy clinic setting, right? We, we don't have the time to say, you know, let's learn Vision RT. How do we apply it to patients? Um, but rather than putting it off, we, we really had to start using Vision RT because those breast patients were very complicated to set up. We were having setup issues, a lot of pitch, a lot of rotation. And so what, we, what did we do? We started doing additional marks on CT, uh, doing more indexing marks, doing daily KVs, saying maybe this could help us set up the patient, kind of troubleshoot what's going on. However, doing daily KVs is additional exposure to the patient, um, and we still had some difficulties with some patients with one arm up, one arm down, just trying to get them through the bore with a little bit larger size patients. So, you know, we, we started using Vision RT for our first patients, and therapists initially were reluctant, and you know. There is some, uh, some challenges we face, but I do have to say the therapy team was, was very responsive and very dedicated, and, and I'm very grateful and proud to be working with the team I have. Uh, but initially, they were reluctant uh, to use the system, ma mainly like, well, this is going to take five more minutes, or, hey, we can't draw the ROI till the end of the day, and it's already 7, 8 o'clock at night. We don't want to stay past that, you know? Um, we all had staggered lunch breaks, so long hours treating a high volume of patients on one linear accelerator. And the other thing was, well, we haven't had any training. You know, why are we doing this? We're still trying to get comfortable with the, with the center. And so unfortunately, we didn't have the ability to put in a large bore or uh, overcome some of those challenges. So what we did is we started off with some of the webinar trainings, really using the SGRT forum to, to see what other people were doing, what their challenges were, so we could really leapfrog over some of those challenges and uh, have a better implementation. And we brought the on-site training. But what happened with on-site trainer? We're treating 45 patients. When are we really gonna get to train? And so I think that initial training wasn't as successful for us uh, because we didn't have the, the dedicated time. You know, we spent 15, 20 minutes here and there. Um, most of the patients weren't already set up um, using Vision RT. So I think teamwork and buy-in from the group is very important. Anytime we uh, talk about new technology implementation, and I think as physicians and physicists, uh, you know, we go to meetings and start going to vendors and we see all this great stuff or we see it, go to a clinic and see great things happening and we want to bring it back to our clinic. But I think making sure that everyone in the group understands the importance of this technology, importance of uh, implementing this technology is, is very important because if we don't, I, I think we can have some pitfalls or some struggles. So I think some of the challenges we faced were, is a culture shift. Well, we've been doing daily KVs, it's working fine. You know, why do we need to use Vision RT? Um, this is a workflow change. 
we were rapidly hiring more and more therapists to cover the long hours. Well, do we train them or do we train them on the old workflow, the new workflow? A lot of challenges, you know, and, uh, and a lot of long hours. Um, and sometimes, well, Vision RT is not working. It's saying, tell us to go to the right when it should be going to the left or the roll's the opposite direction. Well, that's all about the ROI, right? The region of interest. Because if you're drawing uh, the region of interest in a large pendulous breast and you know that the breast might be not the ideal place every day, we really need to draw the ROI to monitor things that are stable. So that was some learning that we had to do in, in some training. Um, and then sometimes using the DICOM uh, to set up a patient's um, we might need to mo modify that than actually capturing a monitoring field or capturing a new reference. So from day two, we could set up the patient a little easier. So I think a lot of challenges in a busy clinic environment, but I think education and training was important. So what we did is we said, you know, I'm going to put it in the prescription. We have to use Vision RT on every single breast patient. And so I think that really helped uh, us utilize it more and more. And when we brought out the trainer for the second time, we had 20 plus breast patients on treatment. So we said, Write down the patients that it's working well on and the patients that are, we're struggling on. Let's have the trainer help us out. So rather than having dedicated time to, tr uh, to train, well, we're training on real patients, you know. How do we adjust the ROI? What do we need to do to make this successful in our clinic? So we really did overcome a lot of these challenges, and I'm very excited to, to say that we've continued to advance and, and started our DIBH program and really use it across the board. So an example, we talked about ROI, you know, sometimes, and I think there's some talks later today on, on tattoo lists and what's the appropriate reach of interest, and these are straight out of the Vision RT um, uh, training manual. And, you know, if, if someone does have a pendulous breast, really focus on the sternum, focus around the breast, making sure the patient's set up properly, um, rather than trying to focus on getting that breast portion set up perfectly. We know that most of these breasts were treated with 3D fields. We have lots of margin around them, right? So uh, a little bit of motion should be fine as far as where the breast lays. Um, in pelvis patients, you know, if you've got a big belly and they're a belly breather, you know, adjust your ROI to really focus on things that aren't moving if, if they're important. So here's an example of a patient um, who had a periodic lymph node um, so one of the regions of interest, so oh, we're treating the periodic, let's just draw the ROI across the belly. Um, so you can see that every time the patient breathes, well, we're, we're, we're timing out. And actually, the reason we increase that mag is basically not to, to gate the beam every time, mainly because we knew the patient wasn't moving. It was just their belly moving back and forth. So by adjusting the ROI, you can see that the belly area was cut out on that patient. Well, now you don't see that movement. We know that the patient's not moving. We basically took out the area that really wasn't moving. We're making sure that the patient's spine isn't moving. So having their belly move with, with breathing um, doesn't affect our, our beam configuration. So like we talked about before, starting to use uh, Vision RT for our breast patients, um, making sure that they were set up properly. Um, so, so this was the first step, uh, using it for setup, as well as monitoring them, and you can see that the patient's set up better and better. And then it came to the complexity of, well, let's take this one step further and let's do deep inspiration breath hold, because as we know in the news, um, you know, heart disease is a significant problem with chemotherapy in our patients, uh, and they're worried about having their heart radiated when we're treating left breast patients. So this was another so-called complexity that we wanted to add to the clinic. So, you know, how, we don't want to, you know, therapists gave feedback, well, we don't want to start doing this on a real patient. We want to have some practice and uh, using different phantoms or uh, products really weren't helping us. So what we did is we had one of our dosimeters who volunteered, um, works out every day. Um, and so he said, sure, I'll be the patient. So what we did is we captured a reference on him and um, basically had a free breathing and had him take a deep inspiration and captured another reference. And so every day, uh, the, the therapist would schedule him as a patient, put him on the machine, um, set him up without any marks, without any tattoos, uh, get him set up properly, uh, and then have him take a breath in. So over time, they accomplished this. So this is the actual, um, so they tell him to take a breath in. He looks like he's good, maybe needs a little bit more, T tells him to take a little bit more breath in, and now he's able to hold his breath. So really utilizing all members of the clinic 
to implement this technology I think is very important. So after doing uh, our dosimetrist uh, multiple times on, on the table, the team felt comfortable. They said, sure, we can do this uh, for a left-sided breast patient. Um, and we said, if we need to, we'll start on the right side, a patient where we don't have to worry about, where you know, if, if, if they're not able to hold their breath or we have some challenges, we can practice on those patients. So this also helped our dosimetrists realize it's really hard to hold your breath for 30 seconds. So they realized that, you know what, we need to make those beams shorter, not really do all those field and field and control points. So I think that was a learning lesson on their part as well. So luckily the administration was uh, very uh, uh, appreciative of the increased numbers and very supportive of our clinic. So about four months after we uh, opened the clinic, they, they decided to put a second linear accelerator in. So very um, unheard of normally for administration to want to put in a couple more million dollars to put a second linear accelerator in a few months. And I was somewhat skeptical because I said, well, maybe we just front loaded the system and had 40 patients. Is this trend going to last for multiple years? Uh, but they said, no, we're going to do this because we don't want y'all to treat 10, 12 hours a day. We want to give patients the opportunity to pick their time slot and say, well, the next time slot is 7.30. Well, you know, that's not acceptable, especially if they've had chemo in the morning. And so we decided to put an put a edge in. And, um, so we, get, we, we were on the fast track, got, got it delivered in November and installed in January and started treating in January. So that really helped our workflow because that basically balanced out the machine. So we went from 40 patients up to 60 patients, of course. So it's still a pretty busy day, 30 patients on both sides. And then later that year, we got a wide bore CT. So I think that helped solve a lot of our challenges um, and uh, with our breast setups. And it really gave us a lot more flexibility and able to uh, treat our patients. So I think after training, we all thought that breast was the, the, the number one indication for Vision RT. But after using it more and more in the clinic, the therapist asked us, hey, can we use it for this patient? I think this patient can benefit. And over time, we really used it on almost all patients. So uh, with starting our radio surgery program, uh, we use it on brain radio surgery. Uh, we'll talk about some prostate, uh, uh, prostate or pelvis indications, uh, extremity, and really gating the beam, which we talked about, I think is very important to make sure that the patient's not moving during these treatments. So this is an extremity application. Uh, a patient had a sarcoma near the ankle and needed some post-operative radiation. So pretty simple field, just oblique fields, uh, two fields, um, fairly simple treatment. Um, so we used a extremity aquaplast to immobilize the patient. And you can see that there's this tape here. And, and the question was, you know, I went in the room on the first day and I said, you know, why are we using this tape? And they're like, well, we're just having difficulty getting the, the patient lined up properly. And so I said, okay, let's, let's take a look at that. Um, so every day there was a little bit of, uh, they had some marks, really weren't having too much success. So they said, well, can we use Vision RT on this patient? Let's see if the extremity can line up better. And so what they did is they made an ROI and able to set up the patient perfectly and monitor that they're actually holding that, that where we need them to be. Another extremity application, um, uh, upper thigh sarcoma, so the patient was frog-legged, just to help with uh, preventing some moist desquamation. Lots of, lots of skin marks, as you can see, on the patient uh, to help us with the positioning. However, there's always a little bit of roll or a little bit of pitch in this patient, even though put in a vacuolock bag. So using Vision RT to make sure that they're positioned properly. And so uh, I think a lot of use other than breast for our patients. And I actually, I didn't get a chance to add this to our slides, but yesterday, right before I was catching my flight, therapist called me and said, hey, you know, there's something wrong. Uh, patient's not setting up. We use vision. They've been setting up for two weeks, perfectly fine. SSDs aren't setting up. We looked at the, the set of photos and the photos. There's something going on with this patient. So it was a patient with a chest wall, uh, chest wall patient with an expander in uh, to help for reconstruction down the road. And what happened? The expander had deflated. And they were easily able to notice that the expander deflated just using vision on setup. Um, so we did, we have advanced imaging. So I said, well, let's just verify that. Let's do an on-demand comb beam CT. And we could definitely see that the expander had deflated. So we braked her today, simulated her last night, uh, worked on the plan. So she'll, she'll restart on Monday. So it, it, vision gives us that insight before having to image or providing additional exposure. So. I think the, the therapist really thought that was 
that was excellent uh, catch for them that you might not see just on a, on a daily setup. So we treat our prostates prone uh, using a rectal balloon. So um, you can see here. Um, so in Texas, we have a little bit larger patients. So a lot of times you can have a little bit of roll um, or um, some pitch. So they really thought uh, sometimes some of these patients aren't setting up well with their tattoos or marks. So we started using vision on them. And we can see that they set up very well uh, with vision and actually monitor them. You know, a lot of times they get relaxed or are stiff when we put that rectal balloon in. Uh, but then after a time, they kind of relax so we can really monitor that, uh, that change. So one of, the, one of the reasons for putting it in an edge and not a true beam was we really wanted to, one, add volume to the clinic, but also add uh, different modalities. So we were doing a few stereotactic cases, but they were very limited, mainly lung. Most of the brain patients we were still sending out. So by adding uh, the edge, we were able to add OSMS, uh, which is the Vision RT counterpart, and really start a stereotactic program. So using it for SBRT lung, uh, we set up the patient using vision. We do a cone beam CT to see if there's any minor shifts that need to be made, uh, recapture that reference uh, for monitoring. Uh, we do a KV pair to make sure that those shifts really did apply and that the patient's correct. Uh, we use vision after that uh, to continue to monitor. And we actually floor on the first day to make sure that the, the ITV, which was captured um, using the RPM system in SIM, really does, uh, does fit inside our ITV. And if a patient uh, you know, coughs or breathes, we can see that there is a correlation between vision RT, the beam, turning off and that cough or if they've moved or, you know, once in a while a patient um, had some sinus drainage and they really moved their arms to get comfortable, we could see that on the Vision RT system. So just some examples, we use very big bags, uh, uh, therapists call them the boat bags to make sure that the patient's really in the, in the bag, really doesn't have anywhere to move. Um, and using uh, vision not only to set up but also uh, gate the beam for any kind of motion. Um, also started a radio surgery program. Uh, we used the Encompass open face mask for monitoring with the bite block uh, to make sure that the patients um, really can't move and use uh, the optical surface monitoring system to make sure that uh, we can real time track the patient. And so just some of our therapists setting up a patient the region of interest being drawn um, over the, the open face region and, and using that for setup and monitoring. And, and we've seen that patients who do get a little bit more comfortable, uh, we can see this on the vision. And if we repeat a cone beam CT, it does correlate uh, with whatever minor pitch or roll that we have noticed. So uh, a radiosurgery patient uh, using the open face mask. And uh, we do. Uh, Sorry, we do get the beam uh, for these patients as well. So for our SRS patients, uh, set up using vision. Uh, we typically tighten down uh, one notch on the Encompass system, um, do a cone beam CT, use the six-doff couch to make any corrections, do a KV pair, um, and uh, check a 2D, 3D match. And, and our therapists know that, sure, the couch can go three degrees, but we try to limit the, the couch motion to less than one millimeter. So if there's anything, or sorry, one degrees, if there's anything more than that, they really need to reset up the patient. But uh, we've seen the correlation, like I mentioned before, that if they get comfortable, sinus drainage, any kind of motion, you know, we are able to do that. And with the continuous motion, treating the different arcs uh, at different uh, couch kicks, we're able to real time uh, monitor the patient and not have to repeat the cone beam CT. And if they ever fall out because we lose a camera because the angle or um, the location of the gantry, we bring them back to zero and see that they're really in place and then move them back over, knowing that they haven't moved. And so you can see very minimal motion, real-time tracking um, for a radiosurgery brain patient. Uh, we also use them for a variety of uh, body sites. This was a patient. Uh, with uh, liver metastasis doing uh, radiosurgery. We actually use abdominal compression as well for this patient. Um, and from simulation to treatment, he started having some irregular breathing. So the question was on day one, uh, after we do the imaging and we do the floral, we saw that there was a significant amount of motion. 
And so the question was, well, do we bring him, do we re-simulate him? Uh, do we do a gated uh, treatment using the RPM system? Or, you know, can we use Vision RT? So what we did is we did an experiment and said, you know, let's, let's go and fluoro the patient. And while we're fluoroing the patient, uh, because he did have some markers in there, and see where's the motion. And we could see that, unfortunately you can't hear, but every time that it did turn red, we had two people watching and they said out and out. And we did see the correlation between those fiducial markers being out of the volume and the Vision RT system gating the beam. So what we did is we, we did this twice on the patient and then basically said, let's, let's move forward and treat this patient. So I really think when we're uh, implementing in this clinic, we, we've really been successful because of buy-in due to the whole clinic. Uh, you know, everyone understanding the importance of the system, why it's important uh, for workflow. It's really helped optimize our treatments times. Um, a lot of times we're, we're ahead of schedule because using Vision RT, uh, they feel the benefit for patients, uh, especially being in Houston with a lot of competition. Marketing the Vision RT system has really had patients not just within the system want to stay within the system, but also outside patients coming and saying, you know, hey, I went to this clinic and they're not using Vision RT and I'm worried about my heart being a left breast patient. So we're actually pulling more volume into the clinic as well. So that's been very helpful. Um, and, I, and I think the important thing is we can use it for any, any patient, but I think training and, and uh, making sure everyone feels comfortable with the technology is very important. So I want to thank uh, the, the team uh, for making our clinic successful and taking good care of our patients and, and Vision RT, um, our representative John, who's been very uh, um, important for us and instrumental in making sure that um, we have the right training, we've done a site visit to uh, other sites so that way we can see the technology implemented. I think the SGRT forum also has helped our, us do a lot of webinars and trainings during lunch times for our therapists. And uh, I, I really think uh, I'm excited to learn more about the system and a lot of the breakout sessions for hands-on. And I really encourage, I know there's a lot of therapists and physicists and a small uh, portion of physicians, but I think when you do go back, try to encourage your physicians to attend these kind of meetings or, or learn, and so that way they can be part of it, so be part of the group in implementing this technology. So thank you.